Does the nervous system also seem quite confusing to you? How many antidepressant drugs do you know? I mean, there are 8 neurotransmitters in our nervous system that play a role. There are more than 5 different antidepressants that have different mechanisms of action. So, that's quite complex. But on this video, we'll go step by step and hopefully everything will make much more sense to you. Let's go for it. Alright, so in order to understand the pharmacology of antidepressants, it's really key to understand uh, basically the pathophysiology of depression. So basically, what are the symptoms and how the disease uh, develops so that we understand how the drugs, the antidepressants, can fix it. So, first of all, what are the main symptoms and signals of depression? They are sadness, loss of interest, less ability to feel pleasure, people are more pessimistic, they feel hopelessness, mixed anxiety with fatigue, they have sleep disturbance, sometimes they have insomnia, sometimes they oversleep, they have less sexual interest or they can have a decreased ability to concentrate. Okay, there are eight neurotransmitters in our nervous system, but we'll focus in the three main ones for depression, the monoamines. So the monoamines they are serotonin, noradrenaline and dopamine. So first of all, the serotonin. Serotonin, it begins with a S, is very important in our sleep and it's the mood neurotransmitter. It's the one that is responsible for our happiness. That's why people in depression, they tend to feel sad and they also have sleep disturbances. Then the second one is noradrenaline. Our noradrenaline or, uh, and adrenaline is the one that is activated in stress situations. So it's the neurotransmitter of the stress. It activates our sympathetic system and we feel alert and we get all the energy to tackle any situation. So that's why people in depression, if they have it low, then they may lack some energy levels. And the third one is the dopamine. The dopamine, to understand this one, will focus at the beginning of the word, DOP. So D stands for determination, the O stands for obsession and the P for pleasure. So, people uh, that contains the low availability of this neurotransmitter, then they may uh, get like a decreased ability to feel the pleasure. Alright, so, before going to the pharmacology of the antidepressant, just give me a thumbs up if you are enjoying this video, and subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss any other future videos. Let's go for it! So, first of all, let's just design our uh, neuron that will release our neurotransmitters being in serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine and then they will act on an effector so they will act in particular receptors so let's start with it okay so the first class we are going to see is the SSRIs which are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So, SSRIs. So, let's say we've got serotonin in this uh, vesicle. So, serotonin will be showing in red. On a normal uh, activity, the serotonin will be released uh, to this gap here, which is the synapse, where it will be available to act in our effector. So that's the normal way. And then our neurons, they possess receptors on the presynaptic uh, neuron, uh, which are able to make the reabsorption of the neurons back to the uh, presynaptic neuron. And in the case of the serotonin, they are called the set. So basically, they make the reuptake of the serotonin back, so we don't have the serotonin making its normal effect. However, these drugs uh, can make this not happen. So if we block this transporter, we block the reuptake of serotonin, so we make it to stay in the synapse to do its job. So in patients with 
uh, depression when they lack serotonin. If we block this process, then we'll have more serotonin available to tackle the depression and do its effect. So that's pretty much the mechanism of action. So some examples of SSRIs, they are citalopram and escitalopram. We've got fluoxetine and we've got sertraline just to name a few. They are the first line to be used in depression, but they can have some side effects. So, the main side effects are when there is much uh, serotonin in the synapse, people may feel too agitated, too irritated, so that's one of the side effects. And also, uh, we've seen that the serotonin in the gastrointestinal system makes it move quicker. And if the serotonin is acting much on the gastrointestinal system, we can have patients suffering from diarrhea, vomiting, basically all that being stimulated. Also, uh, if uh, the SSRIs are discontinued very rapidly, if we just suddenly uh, put a patient off them, then patients may suddenly not have any serotonin available, which will be very strange to the body. So we've seen that serotonin is very important for sleep, serotonin sleep, so that can make sleep disturbances. Okay, then our second class is pretty similar to SSRIs. It's the serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. So they are the SNRIs. So, Basically, not only they block the transporter of serotonin back, but they also block the transport of noradrenaline back. So noradrenaline, or also called norepinephrine, can be transported back to the neurons when they are released by a transporter called NET, norepinephrine transporter. So, what these do is blocking this transporter as well. What is the result? We'll have more serotonin and we'll have more noradrenaline or norepinephrine available in acting. So, we'll have a patient with more serotonin, more satisfied. We have a patient with more noradrenaline. We have a patient which is with more energy. Normally, the noradrenaline, they will act then in the alpha receptors, beta receptors, and the serotonin, normally, they will act in the 5-HT receptors, in the, in the effector. Okay, so, if we've got, uh, like, a drug that is, like, with complementary benefits, why don't we give it first? It's basically because of the side effects. So these SNRIs, they will not only have the same side effects that we talked before for SSRIs, but they will also exhibit some uh, side effects related like uh, with increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. So the main side effect with them is hypertension. So we, we, by giving it to a patient that has got already a history of hypertension, or even if they do not have, they can develop high blood pressure. So that's why they are not the first choice. So, some examples of SNRIs, they are Velofaxin and Duloxetine, for example. They are the most commonly used ones. Because they exhibit this noradrenergic activity, uh, these drugs, Velofaxin and Duloxetine, they can be sometimes used uh, for pain, for fibromyalgia, so that's another indication to them. Okay. And then we've got a third drug class, which are the tricyclic antidepressants, so TCA. So the tricyclic antidepressants, they will also uh, block the reuptake of serotonin and noradrenaline, so same thing to the last class, but they will also have effects in other receptors. So they will act in histamine receptors, as well as in muscarinic receptors. So on the postsynaptic, they can block these histamine and muscarinic effects. So this will lead to more side effects. So when they block the histamine receptors, we can have sedation as additional side effect. And when they block the muscarinic effects, we'll have like basically anticholinergic effects. So patients with these drugs, they may feel uh, dry mouth, urinary retention, constipation, all those depletion of secretions that 
a result of anticholinergic effect. So, some examples of tricyclic drugs they are amitriptyline, nortriptyline, then we've got clomipramine and imipramine. So just as curiosity, the mitriptyline and nortriptyline they can be used as well for prevention of migraines and also for neuropathic pain. They have those additional indications. And on the last note, the tricyclic antidepressants, they can also block the sodium channels in our heart. So basically they will have an effect similar to the antiarrhythmic drugs. So basically they can cause really cardiac abdomen ability, so they have like some cardiac effects on the top of it. Okay, we are nearly there. So our fourth class is the monoamino oxidase inhibitors. So monoamino oxidase other way around inhibitors. So what do they do? We need to introduce you to an enzyme which is the monoamino oxidase uh, and basically this enzyme is responsible for the breakdown of serotonin and noradrenaline and also for the dopamine, the other monoamine that we talked before. So it metabolizes, it gets them active so they do not have their action. So uh, as the name uh, indicates, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, they block this enzyme. So it doesn't ruin doesn't get rid of our serotonin, noradrenaline and dopamine. We have them elevated so we can tackle depression. But there is an unfortunate uh, side to it. The monoamine oxidase inhibitors, they have really strong side effects. And especially, uh, not only with drugs, but especially with food. So uh, when it comes to food rich in tyramine, basically, uh, I didn't say, but this monoamine oxidase can be found in the brain, but also in the guts, in, in the liver. So our monoamine oxidase in the guts are responsible to help in the digestion of this tyramine. And if we have it inhibited, then we have the tyramine not being uh, broken down, so it accumulates in our body and it can uh, potentiate like hypertensive crisis or even a stroke. So it's really, really important to be cautious with food in patients that present monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And that's why it's not really used. It's like one of the last resources to use. We've got selaginine which is an inhibitor of the subtype B of monoamine. So that's quite an interesting drug because basically it will prevent the breakdown of dopamine almost only. So it can be used uh, in Parkinson's disease to help people because basically in Parkinson's disease we've got people uh, that contains low amounts of dopamine. And finally our last class, the atypical antidepressants. So atypical antidepressants. So when it comes to this class, they all have their own mechanism of action. So this video is getting a little bit too long for now, so I'll just tell you some atypical antidepressants and then I'll do a second one on antidepressants where I will go more into further detail in which difference each um, drug has got to others, so comparing all of them and then I'll talk loads more about the typical antidepressants. But for now, just keep some in mind. So they are mirtazapine, they are trazodon, which is antipsychotic, the mirtazapine is a tetracyclic antidepressant, then we've got bupropion, which is known to also help uh, and mainly, uh, the main indication is like help with addiction of alcohol, for example and also, for example, lithium. Okay, so that's pretty much it for today's video. I hope all of that made sense. Just re-watch it if needed. Stop, pause the video when you are doing that to take your notes when you think something is important and you want to make sure you don't forget it. Thank you so much for watching it and have a nice day.